This is Authors Alcove, where writers learn from writers. Readers get the inside scoop, and everyone learns something. An episode comes out every Wednesday, where writers share their latest work. Every other Tuesday, where us writers get taught by such experts as editors, book cover artists, and marketing execs, and beyond. So grab a cup of coffee, and let's dive into our next book. Hi, welcome to Authors Alcove. This is Agnes Wolf. Today I have Taffeta Chime. She is the author of two sci-fi coming of age books, Studi and The Last. And as I understand, Studi you actually wrote when you were in high school. Is that correct? That is true. Yep. That is awesome. <laughs> so welcome to Taffeta. Do you mind sharing just a little bit about yourself and what got you into writing in the first place? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I am a lifelong writer. I've been writing since I could hold a pencil, pretty much. I love stories. I love storytelling. I love people. And so what got me into writing? I don't know. It's just always kind of been a part of who I am. I guess we could talk specifically about what got me started writing these two books. But realistically, what got me started writing was just the love of stories and wanting to create them and explore them and learn about people through them. So we're going to talk about Studi first. So you wrote that when you were in high school and you actually showed me a cute little award. I think you should show and say how you got it. I did. This is my star award (laughs) and it says you make the difference on it. It's a little paperweight. So Studi, I have a copy here that I can hold up. So Studi is a young adult sci-fi novel that's a dystopian book about education in the future. And it's the the process of writing it. It was kind of like a surprise book in a way, because like I said, I've always been a writer and I've always wanted to be a writer. And uh, my parents were really great about fostering that in me. And when I was in school, they actually got me into our gifted program. And the gifted program had the writing competition that I entered. I started writing stories for that competition, I think from second grade. And each year, the the stories that we had to write had to be futuristic, research-based stories that were set on certain themes and certain topics. And we had to uh, include certain research and show that we had done that research. So Studi was actually originally a short story that I wrote for this competition when I was in seventh grade. And the theme was about education and artificial intelligence. I wanted to write a story about what would it be like if I didn't have to go to school anymore. And that was kind of the genesis of the idea. And in reality, it's Studi has always been one of my favorite stories I've ever written. And it did not receive any sort of reward or anything in that competition. And not to brag, but like almost every other story that I wrote, at least placed in the state, but Studi just didn't. And I was like, does no one else love this story as much as I did? So I knew that I wanted to expand it into a novel. So when I was in high school, my teachers kind of wanted to help me see what it was like to be a professional writer. And so we actually created an independent study course for me that was a four-year course that I worked on with my English teachers, where we sort of tried out the process of what it was like to write a novel and learn about sort of that writing process and the publication process. I never actually thought that it would get published. You know, I started writing it in 2003. It was published in 2007. So this was a hot minute ago. And I was kind of expecting it to be sort of like a spiral-bound book from Kinko's, you know, that kind of thing. Not actually actually like published, published. Uh, I worked on writing it for two years. Then I revised it for another about year and a half or so. And then started learning about the publishing process when I was a senior. And it was actually in one of my sort of computer professional classes. We did job shadowing and my teacher was like, I don't know any writers, but there's a print shop here that you can go to. And I've talked to them and they said they'd be happy to have you tour their facility. And at the time it was called Lightning Source Industries. It's now Ingram Spark. (laughs) They have a print shop here in Middle Tennessee where I'm based. And so I got to tour the facility with some of their customer service reps. It was a great day. And in there, I talked to one of their sales department people And she asked me, she said, are you familiar with Christopher Paolini? And I don't know if you recognize that name, but he's the man who wrote Aragon and Eldest and that series. And he was very young also when he wrote those and published those. His first contract for publication was through Lightning Source. And they work with small publishers and independent publishers. Again, this was in 2007 when print on demand was still really new and state of the art sort of new wave of publishing. And he said, you know, he 
first printed through us and then he sold 10,000 copies and Shyman and Schuster bought him out and we could do something similar with you. And that was the first time that I actually felt like I, I could actually be published. Like this could actually be like a book book. And so I was like, yeah, I want to try that. And so I published through them. So this little award that I got, like I said, it means a lot to me. This was from my county board of education that I got it as a senior. And I was nominated by my teachers as someone who took the initiative of pretty much putting their education in their own hands. Part of my learning process about this too is also learning about marketing and like what it's like to market as an author. And so after I published right around the time that I was graduating, but then I did so many book tour around my county and visited schools and libraries and stuff. And so that was also part of a reason why I got that award. So that was the process of that actual book. And then my second book, The Last, is actually kind of a similar story because it was an academic project, but it was my undergraduate creative thesis at college. But I kind of followed the same process where it was a four-year plan of writing for two years and then revising and publishing for the following two. And I had a board of professors who helped me out. But because this was on the collegiate level and because I already had one book that I kind of knew what I was doing, this one was more about researching for content. And it's a much more information heavy sci-fi story. And let's see, again, because I held up the other book, I have a copy of the last two right here. So this one is actually also based on one of those short stories that I wrote. And this is based on the very first one that I wrote when I believe I was nine years old. And the topic was about oceanography. I was nine and I liked dolphins and my sisters were studying French in school. So I thought French was cool. And whereas Studi is like, um, an expansion of the short story and the whole novel is sort of the whole short story spread out this one the short story is the first chapter and then it's a it's a continuation it's a, a young adult coming of age story that's more like post-apocalyptic about the end of the world and uh, the main character josephine her father is an oceanographer and he works on a secret government project which is pretty much a housing facility in case of like a doomsday sort of scenario and of course guess what it happens sooner than everybody thought and joe is the last from the surface to survive which is where the title comes from she finds this underwater city and the rest of the story is her growing up in that environment and having to deal with grief and loss and learning to live with people from different cultures and beliefs and societal norms and that kind of thing. Also, while just being a young girl and learning what it means to become a woman and that kind of thing. <laughs> So you mentioned that um, mental health was a topic that you covered in the last. I don't know about Studi, but specifically loneliness. How did you deal with such a sensitive topic for that mi that coming of age group? Yeah, so it is kind of a topic in Studi as well. I would say that um, Studi is more about disability studies and sort of the taboo around having a disability, especially like a learning disability. But for the last, there's a lot of mental health stuff because pretty much everybody in that book is dealing with some kind of trauma. I had to do a lot of research about the psychology and especially with young people and how do young people deal with grief. And so uh, one of the biggest things that you see is that a lot of the kids in that story and a lot of the people in general deal with their grief in different ways so for example joe's father is a problem solver and he definitely is like he's like i can fix this i can fix this and he's really wanting to like get his hands dirty and try to help everybody as much as he can and he pretty much works himself ragged trying to take care of everybody else when he's kind of pushing down his own feelings there are others who you know are more angry and aggressive like you have some bullies in the book and that's their way of dealing with grief and you have some who are more emotional and soft and caretakery type everybody has their own ways of dealing with those sorts of losses and there's a lot of what's called survivor syndrome where people like joe feels a lot of that because she will almost treat her like a celebrity for being the last from the surface to survive and she's like i don't deserve to have that credit like so many of the people i love died 
and there's nothing special about me. Please don't call me that. But she represents hope for a lot of people because they think if you were able to find your way here, maybe these other people that we think passed away, maybe they could come here too. There's a lot of complex feelings and there's a lot of talk about mental health and trauma and grief, especially. A big theme in the book is talking about the importance of thriving in the midst of survival. So there's this place that they're living in. It's a beautiful city. It's this beautiful underwater town that has like, it's preserved certain art and there's all these exotic plants and like the architecture is beautiful. And in some ways it feels kind of like, why would you have such an ornate place to live in when you're just surviving? But the thinking was like, we want people to feel like this is actually a place to live and to have a good life rather than just feel like you're in like a bunker because there's a lot of psychological benefit to that as well. And so there's kind of a theme of that throughout the book where Jo learns that she needs to do much more than just survive. She needs to learn how to live her life to the fullest, even when it's in this terrible situation that she's been dealt. I know one of the main conventions of post-apocalyptic and both of your books are post-apocalyptic, right? Judy is not so much okay. it's more futuristic bad future, but not the end of the world necessarily. But this one is post-apocalyptic. That word's hard for me. So hope is generally a very prominent invention. And you mentioned that she is hope for everyone else. Was there hope that she ends up finding throughout the book without sharing any spoilers? Well, I guess I can share this spoiler a little bit because it's from the first chapter. Joe's mother dies. She's one of the people who dies in the in the war that happens. And she has this hope of like, maybe she's still out there. So even for herself, she's hopeful that her mom will, will come back. She's always kind of holding on to that hope. And everybody has a hope to return to the surface. And they have resources that they're using outside of the city to help clean up the surface so that they can go back and live back on land again and repopulate and that kind of thing. And so throughout the whole book, that's the sort of the end goal is that we're not going to stay down here. We do eventually hope to go back to the surface. So there's that hope that Joe has and everybody else has too. Going back to Studi, she talked a little bit about what it is about, but you didn't explain what a Studi is. Do you mind just explaining the basic plot line without giving any spoilers, but explaining what a Studi is and why she set apart by being a student. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess I, I didn't mention it's about education of the future, but that's all I said, isn't it? So study takes place in a time when kids don't have to go to school because that was my dream. They learn through a machine that downloads information directly into their minds overnight, thanks to a machine that's called a tutor. And when people are pregnant with their children, they take a certain technological medical pill that creates synthetic synapses in their brains to interact with this machine. And so it's kind of like the interface to be able to interact with the tutor. So as the child develops and grows, those synapses grow too. And then the tutor can just download information directly into their mind. So they don't have to go to school. They just learn overnight and then they have to take a test to ensure that all the information is getting received. And so studies are traditional school students. That's the full term for it, TSS acronym. Studi is kind of a derogatory term for someone who has to go to traditional school because for whatever reason, maybe it's something physiological or technological or something, the tutor and the synapses are not working and the, the kids can't learn that way. And in this society, it's just seen as like the end of their childhood because normally in this world, normally kids just get to play and hang out and focus on their social skills and, and just have fun all day. And then if you have a traditional school student, they have to actually go to school and think and read and write. And they have to sit in an out in a desk for hours a day and listen to rules. And it's five days a week and it's every week and it's for like 12 years. And then there's homework and it's awful. You know, it's terrible. <laughs> so the main character, I'm I, her test scores just start dropping and we never really know why. And she just comes to terms with like, I'm a studie. I'm going to have to go to traditional school. And she just thinks her life is over. She thinks this is it. I'm going to be ostracized. It's going to be terrible. I, my life, that, as I know, is going to be over. And her family also kind of deals with some of that 
I guess grief is a word for it, but just thinking about like something is wrong with my child. But then she goes to traditional school. I said I wrote the story when I was in seventh grade. She's about a seventh grade girl and she enters into that school and she learns to read. She learns to write and she learns about imagination and creativity. And she starts to understand that what she thought was normal is not and that she is actually experiencing much more than she ever experienced before. So that's essentially the story of studi. So yeah, studi itself is a made up word and it's it's a derogatory term for someone who has to go to school. <laughs> so how did you portray her personal growth and what part did it play that she was kind of set apart from everyone else? There was definitely that stigma of like, heard that her scores are not doing well and like, why isn't she playing with us anymore? There's kind of this whole side story about a video game that the kids are playing and my brother installs it for her and it's like, she's so excited to play it. And then all of a sudden she can't play with her friends and she can't go to the park anymore to play with her friends. And they're like, I heard that she's not around because she has to go to school. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe it. Uh, and then even her own brother like has this sense of, I don't know how to help my sister. I don't, I don't know how to be a brother for her because what do I, I don't know what to do. But th there's another aspect of the story. Her great grandmother moves in with them and she calls her Gigi Sasha. And I kind of imagine, like this is sort of my headcanon, I kind of imagine that Gigi Sasha is sort of from our generation or maybe a generation or two after us. She's one of the last ones to have books and she knows how to read and that kind of thing. So she went to school and when she moves in, at first I'm is kind of like, oh, we're gonna have an old person living with us and we'll, you don't wanna have to take care of her. But then like she sees some of the, she's like, you have books, like these are like, really cool antiques. You know, she pulls out her old cell phone and her, I might think that that's really cool retro technology. And so when I might goes to school, her great grandmother is there to kind of help support her and be like, you know what, it's not that bad. I can help you read and I can help you with your homework. And so even though she feels ostracized by her friends and sort of left out by them, she finds support in other places that she wasn't expecting. So what were some of the challenges that you encountered when you were writing for, specifically for the coming of age group? There's a couple of different things. And like I said, it's been a minute since I wrote these. <laughs> so I had to kind of think back to it. I remember that I was still a pretty young writer when I wrote these and it was difficult for me to step into characters that were different than who I was. And so for example, I Mai's relationship with her dad is kind of a strained relationship. And I had men read some of the parts with I Mai's father to make sure that I was portraying him well. And even now, like, as you go back and read stuff that you wrote when you were younger, there's a lot of cringeworthy things. There are some, like I Mai's Japanese American and there's incorporations of Japanese culture in her life. And now that I look back at some of that, I'm like, oh, I could have handled that better. <laughs> or the same thing is true in the last where Joe is French. And I really wanted to incorporate multiculturalism in that book because I feel like in a post-apocalyptic world, you know, we're going to have to blend and, and overcome a lot of the differences that we have culturally. Everybody in that book is from a different place and they all speak different languages. They have different beliefs. And there are some times where I feel like I portrayed it in sort of a stereotypical light. I really hope that people see that I meant that very genuinely and kindly. And I look at it now and again, I could have done that better. Like some people might look at that and be like, what was she doing? <laughs> but I feel like as far as the composition goes, those are some of the struggles. In the coming of age story, like both Studi and The Last have aspects of faith that I wanted to include because especially for The Last, you know, that that's a big part of becoming an adult is coming to terms with how do you feel like you fit in the universe and that is something that is a little hard to write and again encapsulate in a genuine way without feeling like I'm being pushy or something like that I didn't want people to be like oh what is this she's like proselytizing in her book and I'm like no this is Joe's journey and this is what she comes to and the same thing is true where in studi I thought it was interesting to think about if Gigi Sasha has books if she's from the older generation, maybe she has a Bible. And especially for a long time ago, and even some today, there's a history of learning reading through reading the Bible. 
for better or for worse, a lot of cultures do that still today. And there's just something about looking at someone's personal Bible as opposed to like just a book that they have. And so she has her own books, but then she also has her Bible. And I, my looks at this and she's just like, what is this book? So there's cer- certain things like that that are in the book that are challenging to write. And I hope that readers read it in a way that's not like me sort of being like, oh, she's getting in these topics, blah, it ruined it. <laughs> and I'm like, I just thought you know, this is something that's interesting and I think important to these characters. And I'm not like, if that's not for you, that's fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that so, makes sense. And so I think especially in the last, when you think about challenges of coming of age, it was like, how can I show that this is an important part of her coming of age arc and not make it seem like, you know, icky. <laughs> I totally get that. Um, mine has a little bit of faith in it too. And it's like, how do you incorporate that without making it sound preachy or I don't want to turn off people, but it's part of that person's journey. I, I know that oftentimes with dystopian novels, and both of them kind of have that element, there is the personal growth often parallels with the change in the setting. Did that happen in either one of your books? So for Studi, I mentioned that there's a side plot about a video game, and it's a retro video game and kind of in the culture, for whatever reason, retro games are like all the buzz right now. And again, I envision this to be something that's maybe a generation or two removed from us. So even for us, it is something that is advanced. So it's like a really high quality VR game. And it's a total metaphorical parallel to what's happening in the story. The video game is called Largesse, which is French for like a gift that you impart to somebody. And it's all about being on this planet where you're mining a certain mineral called Terronium, and it's totally made up. This aspect of it where it says if you play for long enough you will receive a real gift that's like IRL it's not in the game you will receive an actual gift that will be incorporated in your real life and so everybody's playing this game and they're trying to get the gift and no one's getting it and then there's other it's like people say that they have it and especially I buy his brother is like I really want to play this game and like get the gift I want to know what the gift is and he's like on borderline like uh, uh, addicted to this video game and I my plays it throughout the game or throughout the story and it's when she goes to a traditional school that she understands what the gift is in the last chapter or two the biggest thing that changes is that you actually start to have dreams about this video game. And people that use the tutor machine, they don't dream because their brains are being activated at night and, and downloading this information. And so Aimai starts to have nightmares for the first time. She starts to have dreams for the first time, but then she starts to have these dreams actually about the video game. And that's the gift that gets imparted to players. And she's like, that's super cool they'll never understand that like my brother will keep playing this game and will never ever get the gift because he's always using his tutor and so there's sort of that setting gets changed it's like the virtual setting (laughs) gets changed there's also um, a parallel with the game where like the more that you mine and that you come in uh, contact with this mineral the more that your character actually changes and like has physical changes and stuff so again it's like it's all metaphor for like education and learning and you're mining information and then the more that you learn the more that you change and you grow and that kind of thing so there's that and then in the last it's a little less more obvious not quite as deep but obviously like the setting itself does change and they do resurface at the very end and they are no longer in this city and they are faced with a new world and a new life that they have to begin (laughs) so i do have one other question are you currently working on anything i am so i'm i'm kind of working on some different things right now i've had kind of a interesting journey as a writer where like i said it's been since 2011 was when the last was published and i graduated from undergrad at that time and then i was planning to get a creative writing mfa and this is something that i think a lot of writers can maybe identify with I applied to 10 different schools around the country and got rejected by every single one. And I started thinking, what if my writing isn't good? I later found out what I did. I applied to the wrong schools. I applied to like all Cadillac schools and that was really 
of shooting for the stars, I guess. But I really went into a period of depression and I was like, I don't know if I'm cut out to be a writer. Maybe I'm just a big fish, big fish in a small pond kind of feeling. And I ended up taking a trip abroad to study in China. And I went to China, I learned Mandarin for a year, and then I met my now husband. And then we got married a year or two later. I started a master's degree. I got a job in foreign language education. I've been in education now for about five or six years. And I had two daughters, one of them is right here. <laughs> and throughout this period, I wasn't writing hardly at all. I was doing mostly nonfiction stuff. And so then this past year, we had been hosting international students and that was kind of what my job has been since I had my daughters. But since we had the second one, we decided maybe it's time to close that door because now we don't have any extra bedrooms. And I thought, okay, well maybe now is a good chance to get back to writing. And so this year I've kind of been doing more freelance work and I've been doing a lot more networking and things like this to see me like, hey, I'm still here kind of feeling. So I've been doing a lot more nonfiction stuff like articles and things like that, but I'm currently in the process of putting together a book of poetry and I am also working on a bigger project. It's like a creative nonfiction biography fictional thing. <laughs> it's about uh, my grandmother's cousin who passed away suddenly when she was only 17 years old. And this was in 1954. I randomly inherited some of her things from when she passed away. And it became clear to me that this was a really interesting person that the world needed to know about. I found in some of her stuff that she wanted to be a writer. And she has a short story that she started called A Bewildered Heart. And when I saw that, I started bawling and I was like, well, that's it, you're coming home with me. <laughs> and I decided that I'm going to complete her story and publish it for her. And in the midst of looking through her things and learning about her, I realized the world needs to know about this girl too. Her name was Cindy Harriman, and she was just really interesting and quirky and, and whimsical. And so I'm thinking of, I'm gonna finish her fiction story that she wrote, but then also kind of weave it into a biography about her. And I'm expecting that to be kind of a bigger project. I, I'm not at all plugging this, but if any of your listeners think that that's interesting, I am keeping up with the research that I'm doing with her on Instagram on an account called Bewildered Heart 54. So if anybody is about that, there's that. That sounds very interesting, especially because you have that familial connection and there's a mm -hmm. lot you can do with that story. That's I'm very curious about that. You'll have to recontact me when you get that one out. <laughs> yeah. The more that I look at it, I'm like, well, this is this is interesting. He was from Japton, Arkansas in the Ozarks and like, part of a love triangle. One guy that she liked, like was in the Korean War and she she died of a heart a congenital heart defect and she went into surgery for it and died on the operating table. And it was really earth shaking to a lot of people in that small community. And she like she liked magic and she has like lipstick stains on all of her books and everything and made her own clothes. And it was small town farm girl who dreamed of going like to exciting places. And it's just so interesting to look at these letters and things from 1954. And it just sounds kind of like something that a teenage girl would write about today. Like it's all about plans for the summer and this boy is cute. And you know, I love this fashion piece. It's so fascinating. It's so interesting. And uh, I just, I love her. And I feel like if she were alive today, we'd be BFFs. So, and I'm just like, the world needs to know about who she is. So. That sounds amazing. I, I'm actually very interested in reading that once you have it done. Maybe I can be a beta reader for you or something. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. Well, yeah, I've already decided it's going to be called A Bewildered Heart because that's what she had her story called. And I think that that's perfect with her heart condition and everything. So oh, it's going yeah. to be a, be a Bewildered Heart coming, nice. what, 2020 seven-ish, eight. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate you just sharing all that you did with your two books. And I do always ask everybody this question, so I need to okay. ask you as well. What is one piece of advice you would give to a not yet published author? I'm going to share something that was kind of a fire that lit under me this year. I read this book that I bought like 10 years ago from a used bookstore and it's one of the worst books I've ever read. 
but it changed my life and my perspective as a writer. It's called How to Be a Successful Housewife Writer, which is an awful title. And it's terribly outdated. It's I think the copyright is 1979 by Elaine Fantel Schimberg. And I'm like, no shame to Elaine. This was great for her time. There's like a whole chapter about keeping your filing cabinet organized and uh, budgeting for postage and making sure you have carbon copy paper and that kind of thing. But the biggest message in this that I was like, I need that, was talking about how if you want to be a writer, treat yourself like a writer and take yourself seriously. I think that so many writers see this as like a hobby. And if you want this to be a job, then treat it as a job. You are your own boss, but you're also your own employee and you need to show up and work, be kind to yourself, be a boss that you want to work for, but also be an employee who shows up but in the work, market yourself, network, do professional development, keep track of your expenses and your time and just treat it like a job and you're a professional. There's someone else that I heard, it was like someone from like webinar that was like, you are not a Taco Bell 24 hour drive through that does work for cheap. You are a five star Michelin restaurant that's booked months in advance. <laughs> and like just treating yourself like someone who has the skill and the passion and the, the capability of doing this work. And I think to me, I was like, yeah, yeah, I have a lot of experience and training. And especially after that hump of not getting into an MFA program, this was kind of the thing that I was like, yeah, I I should treat this more seriously. I, I have the skill. I have the passion. I have the drive. I just I need to treat myself as a professional writer and not just someone who does it on the side. And I have now had my most successful year as far as writing and networking and spite my last book being published over 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked that question because everybody brings something else, even though a lot of people will say never give up, but then they add their own little twist on that or anything. But like you shared something that I have not yet heard from anybody that I've asked. So it just makes me so excited when I ask people and they come up with, and everybody has a different thing that they say, which is why I will probably never stop asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's always good. I've done a lot of like, speaking to younger writers because I myself was a young writer. And so I get asked that question a lot, but I feel like this year I'll have a different answer and I'm like, do it, <laughs> do the work. <laughs> Nice. And it's so funny how like I've almost thought about like reaching out. I have no idea if Elaine Fantel Schimberg is still even alive or not. But I'm like, do you want to do like a second edition and I write it with you because we, we got some work to do. It was good, <laughs> but it needs a lot of work. Like the term successful housewife, like there's successful, ew, housewife, ew, <laughs> the housewife writer, what? And then there's like, every time that she mentions an editor, it's like a male and it's, there's just, uh, there's so many like problematic things in that book. <laughs> but it's like, it's like the core, you were good, but it was, it made me so mad reading it, but it also like, made me want to do stuff. So, you know, I guess mission accomplished. <laughs> Doesn't it make you wonder though, like if you do rewrite it, people 50 years down the road, we'd be like, oh my goodness. What she talked she all about marketing yourself <laughs> on TikTok. Ew, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, Engaging on social media, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you again so much. I really appreciate you joining us. I, I completely appreciate you taking that time. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. You know, when you email me, it just made my day. It made my day. Awesome. Or you email me, message me or something. However we connected, it made me so happy when you reached out. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yay. Thank you. Rec Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of Authors Alcove. We will be back next week on Wednesday where we will have a writer share yet another piece of work. Also, every other Tuesday, we do learn from experts such as editors, marketing execs, book cover artists, illustrators, and more. If you are interested in being a guest on our show, feel free to go to authorsalcove.com, go to the podcast tab, and then click on Be a Guest. If you're looking for a healed heart, hop on over to our sister podcast, Strength, Love, and Healing with Authors Alcove. You can find that on Spotify and the Apple Podcast. Thank you so much for listening today. Have a great day.